So this kind of piggybacks off of last week where we were learning about um, feature engineering methods with categorical. Now we're looking at engineering numeric features, um, which is definitely something that I work with mostly. So this was you know, super beneficial to me. I hope you'll take something out of it. Please um, interrupt me at any time if you don't understand anything, if you want me to talk further, if, if you have any insights that I didn't pick up, please speak up. Um, I want this to be like a, a learning process. I did kind of make notes and essentially did like ultra summarized versions of what was in the chapters. Um, given that this was my first time doing something like this, I probably would have done it differently and maybe focused more on digesting the graphics and using that as the conversation piece. But anyways, we're just going to see how it goes. And sometimes I can talk really fast. Sometimes I can go on a tangent. So if at any point you think I'm going real off topic, topic, please let me know and we can, you know, move on. Um, basically, the the main learning objectives are, as I said, handling continuous predictors. Um, the chapter is kind of separated into three main, um, I guess, techniques that you can use. The first one is how do we address problematic characteristics of individual predictors, like uh, when you have skewed data, when the range is different for all of your variables. Um, the second kind of section is about expanding an individual predictor so that you can represent more complex relationships that your model wouldn't otherwise pick up. Um, and then the last one um, is focusing on actually taking your whole data set and either like reducing the dimensionality or getting rid of redundant features. So think of like a, um, PCA partial least squares. Um, yeah, but this is a very dense chapter and there are a lot of different techniques within each. Um, so here we go. <laughs> um, the first chapter is about looking at um, modifying the characteristics of your original predictors. And so the, the biggest one that we all have to deal with is what do we do when we have skewed data? And so this plot, you know, is sort of like a, your, um, your example of a, of a skewed data set. Predictor B is having this like huge curve um, in the very beginning, and then it kind of dramatically trails off towards the end. And so if you're building a model, um, you may miss the importance of this tail of the distribution, right? And within this book, it's talked a lot about using what's called the um, Box-Cox transformation, which was this, this chapter actually goes more into detail about what are the specific components of that transformation and why it works, which was really fascinating to me. Um, and essentially, BoxCut uses a um, maximum likelihood estimation um, to transform your data using um, parameter lambda. So each variable is transformed in a different way. So it can pick up on things like, let's see, maybe I went further into it. Um, there was like a long uh, equation that it has in the book, but it's essentially it can capture um, linear relationships. It can capture more complicated, you know, quadratic relationships and kind of kind of squish it all into this, this traditional bell curve that we're used to, which is really helpful. Um, I think I kind of, yeah, here's the part where I kind of describe the three different um, ways it can kind of mimic transformation. So if um, if the lambda value is one, for example, there's no transformation at all. You don't need to transform, transform that variable. If um, the lambda value is zero, it's a log transformation. And then if it's, um, 0.5, it's a square root transformation. And then if it's negative one, it's, um, I believe it's an inverse transformation. So you can see how it's like really flexible depending on the shape of each variable, which is really cool. Um, that being said, there are some major caveats to the transformation. Um, you can only use it 
for predictors that are greater than or equal to zero. If you have predictors with negative values, you can use this, um, you know, Johnson transformation. It doesn't really go into big detail about how it is different, but it essentially functions in the same way. Um, and it describes a little bit about like which models this is best to use for. So for tree-based models, for example, it doesn't really use um, polynomial transformations at all, right? It's just an if-else kind of statement that, that builds your model. It actually does work really well when you are using um, polynomial transformations like in linear regression, neural networks, and support vector machines. Um, I think in earlier chapters, um, it showed that, you know, for neural networks, it may only be a slight benefit, right? But for um, linear regression and support vector machines, it can, you know, give you a, a pretty dramatic boost in your um, predictive power. Um, so that's dealing with primarily skewed data. Um, any questions about that? I thought that was really cool. Um, but anyways, the next one talks about is the logit transformation, which you use when your data set, um, specifically the outcome variable, is a proportion. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. Yeah, Federica. About, about the lambda. Yeah. Yeah. How do you identify the lambda level? Yeah, so it it sort of uses um, like linear regression. I can actually go to the equation. I think I have uh, the book up. Yeah, yeah. I tried to recreate it in LaTeX, but <laughs> it's kind of complex, so I gave up. But um, you see there's multiple points um, that lambda is included, right? So it's 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 called a, a power transformation because it's in it's in the exponent, and um, uh, where does it go in here? But you essentially model um, the the lambda, and these are the specific instances where it's applied. So you see, for if it's zero, um, I think this this is just like a a log transformation, right? Isn't that that you specify the lambda level inside the function, the box Cox function or the uh, Yale Johnson, and you say one, zero, or 0 0.6, or no point, no, no point 0.5, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> um, so here's where it breaks down the different, um, the different so the, the, transformations. And you can have mixes of it, right? So if it's like in between the square root and uh, uh, zero, right, you'd get a little bit of a mix. So it's like very flexible. Um, did you yeah, say yeah. something about it being a, a geospatial transformation? I didn't I didn't really get that. The, the inverse, within the, the inverse transformation. Ah, uh, uh, OK. It doesn't really, I guess, so if it's negative one, then yeah, I could see how it flipped things around if it was an inverse, right? Or wait, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but super flexible. Um, yeah. All right, okay. Um, so the next one, as I briefly mentioned, is the logic transformation. This is pretty much only for um, I guess you maybe you could use it for the predictors, but in the books it talks about only using it for the outcome variable when it's a proportion, when it's from between zero and one. And um, you know, I know I have had this problem before where the outcome is a predictor and I get like a negative predicted value, which you can't have that, right? It's it's a proportion. You can't have a negative proportion, I guess. Um, so when you do the logic transformation, it um, I guess rescales it from zero to one to negative infinity to positive infinity and this helps you get around that like weird result and because it's such a, a simple um transformation at the end you can just do um the inverse logic to get back to the original like proportion scale so it's super easy i'm excited to try this out um the next like like 
like a subsection is all about um, standardizing your data. So we pretty much always do this before running a model. It involves, you know, um, centering your data on mean zero, um, which is basically just taking each variable and um, subtracting every value by its average. Pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, scaling is, you know, making sure all your variables have a standard deviation of one. Um, and so this is these two methods, scaling and centering, right? They make generally make it easier to interpret your models, especially if you're using um, linear regression, anything where um, the y-intercept um, needs to be interpreted. And then um, it also helps when you're using typical linear regression, it helps you to interpret the coefficients, right? Because if you have something that's on a totally different scale, its coefficient may be like 0 0.001 or something, compare that to another variable that has, you know, relatively large units. It's like hard to make a comparison about, you know, maybe which is having um, the biggest impact. Uh, um, Ethan, yes, uh, I just want to add and, yeah. you know, uh, bringing something from the previous chapter, uh, the categoricals, uh, we have seen that there's a difference between what we call the traditional, you know, algorithms, for example, linear regression, logistic, uh, uh, K and N, nearest neighborhoods, uh, and neighbors, etc. And then the tree base. Yeah. So in that group, of the traditional, right? The linear regression, logistic, KNN, because they use distance, you know, from the mean to what to the yeah. points, you need this. You need the center scaling, you need the standardization of those ranges. Because for example, if you have a variable that has a big magnitude, for example, salary or population, and then you have something that is more like, uh, let's say humidity, temperature, okay? which the range is kind of, you know, more, uh, is, is smaller, is more discrete. Then you have to bring all those big numbers, you have to bring it to that, you know, to, 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 a, to a, a uniform range. And that applicable to those traditional. Yeah. In the case of tree base, uh, usually uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, and, and you can do the experiment. Uh, in the tree base, for example, decision trees, random forests, okay, gradient boosting. Uh, they don't need because they're not using distance, yeah. you know, as a measurement, you know, to get the, you know, to get the result. They're using splits um, yeah. because they use that mechanism, like in the categorical, you don't need basically to do anything. Of course, sometimes it's better to get a uniform data set and you do the scaling, you know, for different models, even the tree based, but yeah. it shouldn't be uh, altering the output even if you didn't scale yeah. okay so uh you know sometimes for example if you uh, are working with tidy models what you can do is uh have a recipe for let's say linear regression if it's a regression problem and have a, another recipe for a decision tree regression and sometimes you don't have to include that scale okay so that that's something that is always good to have you know in your in your line of thought because sometimes you know you think, okay, you have to scale it, I have to center it. No, it depends on what kind of algorithms you are going to be feeding into. Yeah, that's a really good point. This yeah. actually came up uh, in one of my modeling projects this month. I was using uh, uh, a neural net and uh, um, gradient boosting trees, and I forgot right. to center it. And the the neural nets did terrible, 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 terrible. And I didn't understand why until I realized what it was. Um, and then once I centered and scaled it, like basically artificial nets and trees were basically like the same. <laughs> so it was like a huge impact, right? But obviously the trees, tree method was impervious to that. So that was pretty cool to see. Exactly, yeah. The, the tree base, you know, they really don't, don't, don't use the distance, you know, that distance measure. But the, but the other ones, you know, some of the traditionals and deep learning also uses it. Yeah, yeah. Very cool stuff. Um, the other, the last thing that was in this section um, was about smoothing um, sequential or time data, which I don't really use that much in my work, but I did 
find that it was really interesting. Um, so here's just the raw data of some, you know, sequential problem. It this may be like the train data set. I can't really remember, but you see how there's like some major like outliers in here that would probably um, really distort your model, and then taking a median smooth uh, a median smooth method where you're looking at um, a couple points before or after to kind of set um, the median. It kind of gives you much more a smooth curve. One thing it does say is that you need to be really careful on how big the window of your smoothing is. Um, because if you make the smoothing too big, right, you're going to miss out on some really important trends. But if you make it too small, you're really not going to get any smoothing at all. And I would imagine you could probably, you know, use some sort of grid search or something to help you find like the optimal window. Um, but yeah, that was pretty interesting too. All right. And then the next big section is about transforming individual predictors. Um, so like expanding them into too many. And um, the first section that it, it talks about is um, nonlinear features via basis, basis expansions. And so I had to do, um, as I normally do, just quickly look up the definition for basis. And so just to remember a basis is a set of, of vectors such that every vector can be written uniquely as a finite combination of vectors of that basis. And so um, this purple line right here in both of the cubes, that is the original vector, vector and the purple and the red um, are, the are different bases for that one vector. So that's essentially what we're doing in, in these uh, basis expansions. We're taking that one um, original vector and expanding it into um, to, to many to hopefully get uh, uh, a better explanation of the pattern within the data. Wow, this is small. OK, let me zoom in a little bit. Oh, maybe there's no zooming if I do it this way. <laughs> OK, sorry, so sorry if you can't really see. Um, I think the, the first one that it mentions. You, you uh, can the, use the, the A on top uh, of the. Oh, yeah? The, yeah. Oh. Oh, this is cool. Oh, I love this. That's awesome. OK, that's much better. The graph still doesn't look great, though. Oh, now it's really big. Oh, it doesn't really change the, the graph. That's OK. Oh, and I'm getting some lag. OK, all right, well, that's OK. Just so you can see the general like outline of it. Um, so the first expansion it talks about is the cubic basis expansion. And it's kind of um, like you would imagine it to be. It actually uses um, sort of linear regression to create um, like a squared and then a cubic um, you know, x value. And then you actually model the beta coefficients for each of those new variables to construct um, your basic expansion. Now that really works well when you have sort of like a linear trend, right? But our data typically doesn't look like that. And so as an example, you have this um, scatter plot from the Ames data set where you have lot area and sales price. You see right here in the middle, there is this um, distinct linear trend, right? But once you get to the right and the left, that kind of disappears. So you really don't want to do uh, a, a cubic basis expansion. What it recommends for a situation like this is to use um, polynomial splines. And so this was really cool to um, learn about. Um, sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. Um, <clears throat> And essentially how the splines work is that you separate um, your predictor space into regions and the border of each region is called a knot. And within those region, it models um, a different set of functions. So it, it like breaks, it breaks up the predictor space into pieces where each different piece um, has a different um, function. So that can, you know, dramatically, uh, improve the fit of your model. 
This method is um, used a lot um, in general additive models. And also, I believe, maybe I mentioned this later, yeah, in, in lowest regression, where you're basically using um, a supervised method to, to smooth uh, your typical regression line. And here is an example of how um, the splines work. So it's essentially breaking up that original lot area sales price into um, different regions. And here's the final result where each um, region is separated by these blue lines. So these blue lines are actually the knots. And you see how like each shape within the boundary is a little bit different, um, which gives you a much better result. And the selecting the number of knots is is also really important. Um, you could, I think a lot of people look at their original scatter plot and decide, um, you know, manually what those, I guess in this case, maybe percentiles would be. So you could do, uh, you know, all your, your quintiles, or you could do some sort of a, a grid search and um, find what would be the optimal number of knots and their boundaries. I um, thought that was really cool, especially because um, I think GAMS have been getting a lot of attention recently from Meta. So I was really interested in learning more about that. I thought it was interesting that um, GAMS couldn't model interaction effects. And I don't really understand why that is. But um, yeah, something to really explore in the future, I think. Um, and the other the other ones it mentions are sort of versions of that, where you have this, this, this plot where you have different knots or hinges that kind of um, uh, help you with the modeling process. So the next one I mentioned is, is called MARS, which stands for Multivariate Adaptive Regression Spline. And it creates um, essentially hinges. So you see here on the left and the right, it creates these, uh, these points where you kind of separate the functions. I would imagine, and here's the final result. You can see there's like basically two hinges right here. And you you create, um, you create these hinges essentially using um, a regression model to, to, to create the actual function within each of these different regions. Pretty cool. And then the last part of it, is about um, taking your predictors and essentially converting them to a categorical variable. And what that means is essentially binning your, uh, your predictors. And um, a couple of years ago, I worked with primarily um, uh, census data and the census uh, loves to put different age groups in bins. For example, so you have like uh, less than 18 years of age, 18 to whatever, 55, and then there's like a category for for older Americans, and it seems to work sort of well because those groups have sort of sort of like distinct characteristics, right? But this section actually goes into why that's not good for modeling and why you should only really use it as a last resort, and the reason for that is. Um, because you can use a lot of nuance in your data when you when you bin it that way. Um, you can lose um, the ability to really understand some major trends. So if you're binning from uh, age of 18 to, to 55, for example, there may be some like life midlife crisis in the middle, right, that you would be missing. Um, and also it increases the probability that you will model relationships that are not there. It, it has a bunch of resources to, to literature where you could read more about this. But essentially when you bin, it actually um, can inflate your R squared. The example it, it gave doubled the R squared um, when the data was binned. And so you have an example here, here's the pre-binning um, predictor. And here is, I guess the predictor after it's been binned. And so you can see how this binned uh, plot looks like it fits much better, right? But in reality, you're mixing all of this other information. 
Um, and here's just like the breakdown of, you know, you can see there's much bigger spread in the raw data than um, when it's binned. So that was a really interesting section. Uh, Ethan, uh, just yeah. uh, two, co two comments here. Yeah. Okay. Because I have worked, you know, a while with, you know, trying to uh, make sense of uh, binning, binning yeah. some of unruly data. And one of the advantages, okay, you know, we, we, we can, we can, we can understand the disadvantages, okay? Yeah. You know, it, it kind of, you know, uh, discretize the, the, the data, then you lose all the nuance and all that, but that could be noise too. So, you know, you have to, you have to uh, kind of experiment with, with, with this because sometimes it's not good to have the noise. Uh, you have to filter the noise. And one of the filtering mechanisms is discretizing. But the other thing that works very well is that when you have outliers, in your in your feature, the this the 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 bin, uh, uh, nullifies those, those are liars. In other words, in, they fall into one bucket. So, for example, in the aims, uh, they got said you know the, the the sales price of the house. In the sales price per se, you have outliers there. You have I think that there are a couple of outliers that you know houses that are you know way out of the you know, of the grid. So one of the things that you can do instead of modeling as a regression, is model it as a classification, uh, you know, model, depending on the urban business needs. And what you can do then is dis dis discretize that variable into buckets and then get, you know, rid of that outlier, you know, issue. But of course, you know, you can transform. So that's why uh, I think the author is very uh, keen on saying that this is a last resort because yeah. you lose information, definitely. You lose information when you put it in, in in a couple of buckets, but it's something that you sometimes have to do when dealing with, uh, like I say, or really uh, data, you know, data that is really, you know, uh, it doesn't yeah. fit the transformation, it doesn't fit, you know, uh, the polynomials. For sure, and with with the census data, right? There are some buckets that really make a lot of sense, and some that really don't. <laughs> so you right. probably would want to make a comparison between children and um, retirees. Those are like distinct periods of life. Whereas like the middle buckets, oh, it's really di the difference between 35 and 25. Like that's kind of missed right. in there. Um, but yeah, very interesting stuff. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. Okay, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. <laughs> this last chapter was definitely the biggest. Um, but I got through it, so I'm real happy for that. And just to, to recap, the last section is about taking all of your predictors and um, either reducing the dimensionality to speed up computation or um, converting all of them to get rid of some um, um, things like outliers and multicollinearity. And the main four parts of this, so it breaks up the different methods into um, linear projection methods. So like uh, PCA, um, autoencoder, autoencoders, which is uh, uh, uses neural networks, spatial sign, which uh, I'm definitely gonna have to read more on that topic and distance and depth features. There's definitely a lot more information on these last two, um, but they didn't really seem to work that well even with the data that uh was in the chapter but i think they're they're worth mentioning and they use a really funny um example for the spatial sign which i'll get to later um so the first subsection linear projections like i said is is typically your your pca the principal component analysis where you're taking your um original data and projecting it using you know linear combinations of the different variables and in this way you can drastically reduce your prediction space um, and save computation time that being said um, pca and some others that i'm going to mention are unsupervised so generally speaking it's not going to increase your predictive power although supervised approaches like partial leaf squares generally um, you know, can increase your predictive power, but you have to be really careful with overfitting. Um, so just a quick recap on, on PCA. 
PCA is a linear combination of your original predictors where um, it summarizes the maximum amount of variation in each component. And since they are um, orthogonal components or since they're you know, perpendicular to each other, um, they don't overlap, which means they're uncorrelated to each other, which can be really important for some models. Um, so the like really great graphic that they included, um, you know, here you have your predictor one, predictor two, they are, it looks like they are very closely correlated with each other. And then um, B is essentially what happens when you compute the principal component of that. You know, it's essentially bringing those two, um, those two predictors to the line, right? And so this, this blue right here is, I think that's the, like the error, right? Or the information that is, that is lost, but it's still like a really good representation, right? Um, the second graph that they show actually kind of breaks up um, the five different methods that is talked about in the subsection. So here you have PCA, um, principal components on the far left. The y-axis uh, visualizes each component. And as you can see here, the first component generally um, for PCA includes the most information with subsequent um, components showing less and less. Now that doesn't mean that um, subsequent components don't have valuable information, but you can just see like the amount of variability between them. You can also see in this plot that some methods are better than others. For example, um, principal component analysis, kernel principal component analysis, which is a little bit better. You see that you know even subsequent components have some sort of like trend to them. And then um, the other one that did really well is, is this, this one right here, partial least squares, which almost all of the um, all of, almost all of the variation is just contained in one component. And the reason for that is that it's a um, supervised approach. So you tend to need fewer components for partial least squares. Um, but yeah, kind of a hard graphic to digest, I think. But um, one of the really cool things that I enjoyed from, from this particular section was the use of this heat map to describe the principal components and it groups them to, together using hierarchical clustering. And um, so on the x-axis, you have the principal components, right? And I know it's like really, really small to see. This, this data set was the Chicago train data set. So each variable or each predictor is a train station. And um, when we use PCA, we can see that um, past this first principal component, you e each subsequent um, component has these groups of variables that tend to align with the transit line. So for the second component, um, virtually all of the pink um, line has a negative impact on the principal component. And there are some that have a highly um, positive impact on that component. And so you can use this to kind of say, um, yes, there is the, the line in which a route is located on, you know, has a, a strong effect. Um, this is really cool. This is one of the only things that I, I did actually recreate um, because it's a plotly graph, right? So you can see like, every single variable and see how it contributes to the principal components. Very interesting. So this is even, this is like one of the things that I was a little confused about. So the, here is like the breakdown of the principal components and PCA ranks them in order of importance, right? Um, this second one had, um, I guess, negative importance. I thought that they all needed to be positive, but I guess that was wrong. Like it clearly does not add up to 100% maybe, or I guess maybe if you add all of them, it does, but we're only showing the first five most important components.
And I guess if you look at the graph, it's principal component two is the one with the most, um, I don't even know what the word is, negative eigenvalues. I think this, the, the score is, is eigenvalues, but I, I could be wrong on that, or if it's like some sort of um, projection of the eigenvalues. Uh, Ethan, yeah, uh, I think what you're looking for in those numbers that you have on top of the heat map, uh -huh. yes, uh, maybe what you're looking here, and it's not reflecting this label, is the percent of variance mm -hmm. that the yeah. principal component contains. So maybe these numbers are not the variance, are something else. Okay, because usually the percent of variance is always positive and it adds yeah. to one. Okay, yeah, that's what I so, thought. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we could take a, a look to see, you know, where is that because it creates a bunch of lists, you know, on uh -huh. the PCA object. It creates a bunch of lists, and one of them, one of them gives you the percent of accumulated variance that that particular component contributes. And usually the first one has the most variance. And the second one, the third, and so forth. Okay, yeah. So maybe these numbers are not that because uh, the variance cannot be negative. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, that doesn't make sense. But it is like, right. I guess, if you're taking the absolute value, you know, it would be the second component. Right, right. right. But uh, we have to check on 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 that object to see, you know, which is the list that has that uh, accumulated variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get a, a more clear picture of how many components you need to then have the most variance to then use them for the model. Yeah, very true. And the script that was included um, on the book GitHub account, right? This this section was really, really huge. So um, I'm thinking this is connected to that, but maybe it's not. But uh, yeah, it was many, many, many hundreds of lines of code for this particular <laughs> section. Um, so the next one that I had never heard of was kernel principle component analysis, which, um, works really well if your variables, um, you know, don't have a linear relationship with your outcome. So with kernel principle component analysis, we can model these more complex relationships. So um, you see predictor one, predictor two, it looks like you have a linear relationship here, right? But when we look at predictor one to the outcome, we see this, um, you know, more of a uh, quadratic um, quadratic distribution, right? Which is not optimal if you're trying to make a prediction. And so the only thing about the kernel PCA is that there are many different types of kernels you can use depending on the distribution, right? So I believe, um, so I think they mentioned polynomial kernel and um, a Gaussian kernel. So this one it uses here, I believe is the polynomial kernel. Um, and you can see PCA doesn't do very well um, by itself, right? You, you don't get a really clear linear trend. But when you did the the, the kernel PCA with the polynomial, um, you get this really nice line. And we can see that um, comparing kernel and regular PCA, that the residuals are more closely concentrated, um, you know, towards zero, which is generally what we want. And you can see later there's a plot that shows um, uh, how how good um, each of the different methods is towards improving performance. And the kernel PCA actually had the most variance out of all of the different methods, but um, it still seemed to be much better than PCA most of the time. But it, like I said, it's more complex to set up and like, how do you decide which kernel to use? So you may need to do sort of like a grid search situation to, to find out which one is the best to use. Um, the next one that it brings up is independent component analysis, which um, didn't really perform very well, but it's interesting in that um, typical PCA, 
you have each component is not correlated with each other, right? That's really great. But um, each component is not necessarily independent of the others. So that can really lead to some problems. And what independent component analysis does is um, correct for that. So each component um, is going to be independent. The downsides to using this method is that um, orderings don't really matter at all. Um, so I guess it, it's much harder to decide which ones are important. And um, when we look at this plot over here at the very top, right, it really, I think this is IC. It doesn't really explain a lot of the variance. So it doesn't really do very well. Um, also, you need to use a lot of uh, pre-processing techniques, like it ha everything has to be scaled. It actually says that the predictors need to be whitened, which I'm not sure why they use that word, but essentially what that means is you need to do PCA before you do ICA. So that might make the analysis even more complicated. <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, yeah, that was just like a very small section on that. And then um, the other method, the last unsupervised method it talks about um, is this non-negative factorization. And you can use this only when your predictors are greater than uh, greater or equal than zero. And it's particularly used with text data. So when you have things like um, word counts or um, you know, RGBiv imaging type data, biological measures. And then the last one it mentions is the supervised approach, partially squares, which is like PCA, but it takes into account your response to guide the reduction process. And it does that by finding um, latent variables between your predictors to find like an optimal covariance with the response. And here's a really interesting plot to show you, you know, how well each of these different methods um, has an impact on the, the error, in this case, RMSE. And so you can see um, at the very top, uh, ICA, this non-negative factorization kind of do perhaps the worst um, PCA is kind of in the middle, although there is a large variance. Here's your original data set. Um, so like not doing anything. And then um, partially squares and then the kernel PCA do the best at the bottom. But again, kernel has the largest variation. And all of this was done using the, the Chicago data set. Um, Next is autoencoders, which I have been kind of hearing a lot about, and I'm actually in the chemical industry, which is where this is typically used. Um, and really interesting, it's a, it uses neural networks to find a better representation of the predictor space um, using deep learning. And so this is really beneficial if you have a lot of unlabeled data. And the um, example they use is from the pharmaceutical industry, where um, you're trying to discover uh, new drugs based on their chemical structure. And so let's say you have only 50 data points that you can put in a, a training set and only like 25 that you can all like allocate to the test set. And, you know, pharmaceutical chemical industry, it's really expensive to, um, produce new chemicals. So with autoencoders, we can actually take this very small data set and um, we have another um, data set that's just the predictors, right? So different combinations of chemicals, right? And we wanna label them whether, you know, they have a high yield or not, for example. Um, so we can take those remaining combinations. In this case, they had over 4,000 other I guess, combinations of chemicals or like reactions that, that they uh, model. And we can, we can label that data with just this small data set, which is really cool. I think this is an area that is rapidly expanding as well. And um, you can see here uh, just 
like how quickly it can reduce the error when using autoencoders, like around, uh, I think this is like 50 um, iterations, the error gets really, really low. And um, the second plot um, is based off of, I believe, uh, uh, a KNN model, one with just using the model by itself. And the bottom one is the k nearest neighbors with um, an auto encoded data set. And if you look at the scale on the left, which is RMSE, um, the difference between 70 and 55 um, doesn't really seem that much, right? The distance between them is not very much. But if you're if you're designing chemicals where costs can run really, really high, like this gap right here can save you a lot of money in terms of, you know, rapidly identifying the best combinations of, of data points. So that was really, really cool. The next two, um, I feel like are a little bit less uh, relevant, but they did use a really cool example. Um, so <clears throat> spatial sign is typically used in image analysis, um, and it works by taking your original data points and essentially um, projecting them on the sphere. Um, the data set they used was a data set of animal scat, which scat is the scientific term for poop. So it's a data set on animal poop. And the model is trying to predict, based on the image of the poop, I guess, um, what animal it is. So it's a classification problem. And um, here in this data set, you could see that there's like a major outlier over here. And do it, putting it on this like curve seems to be um, a better a better modeling technique. I don't know. It didn't really talk that much about it, but I thought it was was really interesting. Um, the second one it uses it uses the same data set, but instead of projecting it on a sphere, it is a semi supervised approach. Um, to uh, project your data. So you're looking at um, the different classes and you're taking the average of those classes and you're computing the distance a point is from the different classes. So I guess like here's the data point and you've got um, three different clusters of animal poop, uh, bobcat, coyote, and a gray fox. And you can see, well, based on the distance, this is probably coyote poop. I guess and here is just like a, a a closer view at at what this kind of distance looks like. Yeah, so that was pretty cool and fun. So that's pretty much it. That's all I have. Just a quick recap. Um, like I said, the first section was all about um, kind of centering, um, scaling your data. The second section was about expanding one predictor into multiple using things like polynomial splines. And then the last section that I just covered um, is about, you know, taking your whole set of predictors and um, projecting them into a new space that maybe reduces the dimensionality or, um, you know, increases the, the predictive power. Thank you, Idan. Uh -huh. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good, very good. Cool. cool. Okay. So we are in business. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so next, you left us without words. <laughs> you did an excellent. <laughs> that final note on animal poop, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I want you to yeah, really get to the point. Eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is all animal poop. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, for some reason, I thought that all the data sets were going to be on their GitHub, but they aren't because I tried okay. to find where this was, but only for yeah, a couple this one is, of them, it is exists. private or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's confidential. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so we'll be me next next week. So we'll be looking um, 
at the uh, interaction effect, which is a quite interesting argument. And uh, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. See you, See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.